Oh. One, one. Okay, uh, everyone. Uh. I think we're ready to start. Who's ready to start? I assume everyone. Okay. Uh, today we will talk about how to use um, storability. What is storability? We will introduce you a little bit. And especially to build um, web APIs. Yeah, how to build web APIs through StoryBDD. Uh, first, who we are? I'm Everzet. And I'm Ezult. We work at the KNP Labs as uh, developers, web developers, and trainers. And uh, as you <laughs> as you might guess, we're developing web applications, uh, and we are using a lot of uh, cool tech and cool methodol cool methodologies at our work, and we're experimenting a lot. And uh, usually we're experimenting with some unusual stuff and doing unusual projects with them. And one of those experiments was we are, we, we are using BDD in all our projects. And at some point we started to use BDD for API development because we had a couple of a pure web API projects. Yeah, it was personally the, the most part of, of my work uh, this year. So Yeah. So, first question is why BDD? Who's familiar with BDD here? Oh, great. I was expecting less. So, for just to remind for the guys who is familiar with BDD and to introduce new guys, uh, we'll start from a little bit history. There's not much, so we will introduce so just the informant really important bits that you need to understand. So this all started in at the beginning of 70s when everybody was do, doing development, software development with this kind of process. And it's called waterfall. And if you, s if you look at this scheme, this is exactly why it's called waterfall. Because nothing goes on the top. No, uh, every consequent process goes after previous one and uh, you don't have feedback in any of the stages. And there was a problem with this scheme. And the biggest problem with this scheme was there is a really high cost for software development done through this way of design. And uh, who knows what, what's the biggest cost in software development? What's the, the, the hugest? Anyone? No. Well, yeah, but failure is a part of something, right? So actually, the most cost of software development uh, is caused by s feedback delay, right? And uh, this is something that you see here. When you have nine months of requirements, collection, three months of analysis, then two months of design, it means that you have literally almost 12 months of not developing an application but talking about it. And after 12 months, you have everything, well, you think that you have everything to start developing an application and stop uh, asking questions. But in reality, it's far from, from being true. Because in reality, you need to ask questions in order to make application better or maybe use some technologies that went on the market in the last 12 months. And uh, but you can't because some guys spent nine months doing something and you can't say that they've, they've done something useless, right? So that's why feedback delay is so important problem in software development. And that's why at some point, a couple of guys, a lot of guys decided to remove this problem, to introduce some new methodologies of software development and to fix so feedback delay problem. And uh, there was uh, plenty of guys, but most known one were Beck and Cunningham. In 1996, they introduced this scheme, which is basically a agile development process, right? What they've done is they took the first scheme, the first pro t uh, development process, and they made the cycles in, in, in a couple of parts. First of all, they have test code refactoring cycle, which is TDD, actually. And Introduction of this little part in the scheme, this little cycle, made possible reducing feedback delays to 20 minutes. Because if before you had uh, like nine months of uh, application requirements before you was been able even to start application, now you can 
send some acceptance criteria, a couple of them, for little feature. Development team could test, write a test for it, code it, and refactor in 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and after that you, you already see the feature implemented and if it fits your business or not. So feedback delay uh, was being shrinked to 20 minutes. But for some guys, obviously it was this 20 minutes process or feedback loops wasn't been enough. So at some point, guy called Dan Nort, which he is a Brit, and he in, he just proposed to change a couple of things in the previous scheme. He said like, okay, let's rename things, let's use the same scheme, add additional cycle to the outer loop, and let's instead of talking about testing or designing something that doesn't really exist yet, let's think about design and business goals of our application. And this is actually what how BDD was being born. And in BDD there is a two cycles. There is a story BDD which is outer business cycle in which you talk with business people about the business of application, about the goal and uh, priorities of, of the app you're building. And then there is a spec BDD where you're talking about implementation details. And today we will talk about how to use story BDD to get a little bit into area of implementational details, but not much, just enough to, to talk with technical guys, but about business. So the question is why using this for API, right? And the simple answer is because there is a, qu there is a problems, right? Yeah. When you're developing an API, you have many points to, to maintain together. It, every time you have a, an API endpoint to add, it means you also have tests to write? Well, we, we, s you we, we assume you have, right? It's like maybe you're not testing your APIs, but we do, and we highly propose you to do the same. It helps to sleep well, you know. Yeah. And uh, also, you have the doc to write, because an API without doc, the docs is useless. You have to tell uh, the guy who is using your API how to use it the yeah, right way. Because with, uh, with web APIs, the story is a little bit different from developing usual application. Because for usual application, you have a web interface, web UI, U UX team, which can answer the question of how users should use it, right? Just by looking at your application. With web API, it's a little bit different. You should explain user how he sh should be able to authenticate, use your endpoints, What's the process of doing things? Like you need to have documentation in order for this API to be useful, right? And so you have this simple connection where for each endpoint you have some record in the some tests and you have some record in the endpoint docs, right? And let's assume that we have request one endpoint to add. Yeah. To add, we have request to add one point endpoint and it's not a big deal because we have this connection we know that we need to add one test and we add additional documentation which is one record in each of those descriptions and you you answer the questions of documentation anyway because you're developing an endpoint and you're testing it anyway because you need to make sure that it works right no big deal here but let's see at another example where we actually want to to remove some API endpoint. Here, you also have to maintain the rest, so it's a lot more, f more work because tests, uh, tests are maybe tied together, you have some, uh, some side tests to, to update, so it's a lot more, f more work than j simply uh, remove one test and remove one doc. In fact, you have to, to go into all your tests to remove one everything that is really related to uh, to the feature you you're removing you have to 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 update the documentation the same way so it becomes a lot of work yeah and uh, in this case the biggest problem is uh, that you're not thinking about one addition to each entity you're thinking about some sort of complex change in three independent entities you need to update documentation in some way to 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 keep it clear for the user you need to update the test to make sure that they are testing your application works. And you need to uh, remove the endpoint, right? 
to update the codes, which means that you need to do three works simultaneously and make sure that uh, you've done that. Because at some point, if those connections between loo be become loose, so you then you're losing them, right? Yeah, you're this getting is what rid happens of with it. most of the pro uh, web API projects. At some point, you get either outdated docs or someone in the team decides that uh, testing Web API is too expensive that we can avoid it at some points, at some end points. So you get a situation where you have highly desynchronized uh, endpoints code, endpoints testing framework, and usually, which is in most cases, outdated endpoints documentation. You have outdated documentation for your uh, Web API, and this is what happens with most uh, projects out there right now. Like Twitter has outdated documentation, Facebook, it's a big problem for Facebook, that's why. And we don't see the tests. <laughs> of course, we don't see. So we're assuming that there is the same problem as there is with documentation. And... Uh, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, this is a problem, right? And uh, we had a lot of processes that we used to simplify the our b business uh, business communications inside a company. We, we use StoryBDD for that. And we thought at some point, why not trying to use the same methodologies, the same technology uh, to, to talk about web really more yeah. technical stuff of the website, of web application. And it's hard to describe it without an example, so we'll use a, an example. Could you describe an example? Oh, yeah. Um, we know that developers love SCAT. That's a fact. So we need to to, to keep track of uh, the happiness of our cats. That's why we would like to develop some web service that helps people to keep track of the happiness of its cats. Yeah, because it, it, and actually, like happiness of the cat, the only possible metrics of happiness of the cat is how how many times he pours per day, right? And this is exactly what we will collect. We will collect information about how many times per day your cat pours and then we will build graphics or something. And we thought that like building website on top of we don't really we are not really sure what type of website we can build on it, but we're sure that somebody can use this information. So we'll we just concentrate on doing stuff that we are interested in. We will just do the web API yeah. for collecting data, right? And uh you could start from simple feature which will look like that, like poor statistics. And there oh, is maybe oh. you're not familiar with this uh, with format. Yeah. I, in fact, it's a Gherkin language, which is a DSL for for specification. The goal is to um, to provide um, a tight way of writing specification to avoid uh, misunderstandings. To to be clear. Yeah. Actually, it's like a markdown, but for your user stories of application. So, in like in markdown you're using some specific keywords to mark your text as bold or paragraph. Here you're using some specific keywords like feature to know, to know that there is like feature start. And feature is not nothing else than usual user story in agile methodology. In this case we have one feature which is about pure statistics, it's the title of the feature, and one huge narrative. It's not really huge, it's conventional, but uh, the important part here is like what we have from the narrative. And from narrative, where we you get, get three information. First, the, the the third line I need to be able to access is the way the solution we are providing. It's a, it's a feature. It's yeah, a feature that we're talking about. And after that, we have the first two lines that explain. The second one is explaining who is the target of the features, who will benefit of the feature we are Whose describing. Problems we're trying to solve. So here we are um, writing something that will be, we are describing some systems that will be used by API clients. So that's our target. Yeah, and uh, the first line obviously answers the question is how this beneficiary, those guys will benefit of introducing this feature into the system, right? So we'll start from first scenario. Again, another construction of Gherkin thing you need to know is like there is a special keyword called scenario. You could have many scenarios in one feature. Each scenario starts with scenario keyword. And uh, scenarios are just use cases 
of your feature, like edge cases that you're describing, how your feature should behave in one particular case or another. And in this case, we're describing it with uh, steps, steps that users should do, or someone else, or web application, bot, crawler, never mind, should do to reproduce this edge, edge case, to reproduce this use case, right? We need to know what we're trying to achieve at the end, and that's exactly what scenario answers. And we have like three steps here. Given my cat Snowball is registered on the service, when I send a post to some URL with some data, which is a special string format of JSON, of Gherkin, uh, which applies multi-line multi strings, then I should get 201 response with some specific JSON, right? The problem here is like if some of you are familiar with BDD, with story BDD, there is, it, it's... It, it looks weird because it, it sounds not really easy for, uh, you for take somebody in the street, you show him this spec, he looks at you with big eyes, it's normal. Yeah, uh, as a BDD evangelist, uh, when, when usually I'm talking with guys, there is a huge problem when guys are trying to do, put too much implementation details into the features. And this is becomes a problem because you can't talk with uh, your beneficiaries, your business, uh, the guy who will benefit from the feature in the language that he can't understand. And you can't think about his problem in the language that he can't understand. But this case is totally different. Because, because the beneficiary is an API user. And an API user, an API client, needs this technical information to use your API. Because it's, you can't uh, say on simply say, okay, when I, s when I want to get some data, I get some data. It has no sense. We are describing the way the way this client will be able to interact with our systems. That's why we, we describe, we give details like that. Yeah, and uh, most importantly is like, is not h how deep or how how low on implementation level you're talking with uh, with a feature reader. It's more important on that that you're consistent with yourself and you're talking with him in the language that he understands. And in this case, feature reader or the guy. Uh, about whom we think about is an API client. And this guy is purely talks in the, in the matter of post request, get request, JSONs, requests, JSON responses, a HTTP status code. So there is nothing that API client or API developer <coughs> can't understand here. This is an important point. So we have this feature. It's just a text file. We put it in the features slash poor stats dot feature file and uh, next step is to install the tools that we use that we will use to develop API we will not show you in the uh, like the whole process of developing like with the code but we will show you like the endpoints the interesting parts that uh, you need to add in most of your application in order to use this process so here we have silex which is a a micro framework based on Symfony component. Yeah. I don't know if you already used it. We use Symfony, Symfony just for uh, sake of dependencies. Uh, we don't use Symfony actually here. Uh, then we use Biat, which is a testing framework. This tool is like PHP unit, but instead of testing your implementation or the code, this guy will test our feature files and our API. So it has two two things to test. Your business description, or in our case, application specification, and actual code of uh, your application, that your application succeeds <coughs> in uh, following this specification. And the next step is Guzzle, which is just a HTTP web API cli client, which will send requests, return, uh, evaluate responses. We will use it to perform real requests on our API. Yeah, so to test it. And uh, as we're talking about testing of web API of our application, we, n we need to agree on some point, like on each development machine, we will have the different URL to web API, yeah. and we will do real requests. So we yeah, need every to Every developer has, has you know, all his own setup. Uh, maybe somebody will use some virtual host, uh, some, uh, someone else will uh, use a PHP uh, in 
integrated server, so we need to make this kind of uh, of thing configurable. Yeah. And that's exactly what we are doing here, because the biad.yml is a configuration file for your, what's its name, con the context of your uh, features. We'll see it later. Yeah, and this command that we need to run after that, what it will do, it will look into your features folder. It will find this feature description that we're passing, analyze it, parse it, and uh, will provide you with information, with mapping information that you can use to test those text description, pure business text descriptions, as a test for your application. So it's not like you're using feature for to test your application. It's you're using this something that gener that BIAD will generate for you to test both, to test your specification that it's like correctly written, and that your specification fo uh, your application follows the specification really closely. You will test it, and when we run this command, it will generate those uh, steps, those special mapping information inside one spe special class inside the feature folder for you. You don't need to provide anything. Actually, mapping is done through regular expressions. And take a look at these parameters. Yeah, which we will talk a little bit later. Because he is back here. <laughs> yeah. So if you're familiar with PHP, I hope you do. Uh, this is a feature context class. And this class is actually one single plain PHP class, which tells Behat how to test that your feature, your application follows specification, right? It tells what to do, how For to test that every single step described in the feature is, yeah. is correct, is, is working. Yeah, you can see you have a mapping between the, the steps we, we, are, we had in plain text uh, before. And now you see over every single method, you have mapping a regular information. Exp mapping information. Uh, the mapping is done through regular, regular expression. expression with a special form using some annotations. Yeah, and we're getting some parameters from the text into variables so we can reuse it and those steps are generic enough to be reused in another scenarios, which really important in case of API testing because we have like really limited dictionary in which we're describing API. We have we have only requests with different met HTTP methods, URLs uh, and we have responses with different data and different HTTP status code that we return. That's basically it. And descri by describing this dictionary in, the, in, in form of methods, you form one single class which will test most of your specifications for application, right? So you finish with this class and after that you, you will be able to describe any part of your application without touching it, in most cases. There is exceptions small ones, but usually it's a little bit different with pure business expectations, but we, w when we're talking about limited dictionary of pure web API, it's like that. It's that simple. And uh, we're getting the API URL parameter that we defined before in the biad.yaml file. So we're sure that for each developer with different URLs, we will have different URL requests test for testing. And we're creating Gazal HTTP client, which will do real requests to our real application, and will assume some real responses. Or, yeah. At least if it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because at this point we don't have anything, so it will fail. Like the first step is to make it fail. And uh, what we're doing here is my cat is registered in the service. We have some static call, which will create the the cat somewhere in the database. Doesn't matter. It could be it could be not static call. It, it's just a PHP. You can do whatever you want. Then we're sending some post with uh, request with Guzzle. We're using this client method. Method is post get put or whatever. And you see that uh, when Biat generated uh, this regular expression, it already added some uh, placeholders. some placeholders to Yeah, you don't to give need to write this regular expression usually. Biad does this for you with append snippets. It just generates for you empty empty methods with mapping information done. And you after just need that to put actual PHP code inside. And you get uh, simple arguments that you can use. So that's the way you can make uh, generic scenarios, reusable scenarios. Yeah. 
And there is interesting uh, part in our feature. We can, uh, there are always when we're talking about describing something, there are dynamic parts, right? And dynamic parts are tokens or IDs. And they will be different in each test run or whatever for each user. It really depends. So we are replacing those dynamic sensible information with some tokens that we will just replace, replace inside our context class. So That's usual PHP, nothing extraordinary. So we will do the request, uh, save the response object that we get back to the instance variable of this feature context class. And, and in next step, we will check this response against some rules. First of all, we will check that the the status code is the, the right. The status code is equals to what we expect it to be. So uh, we use the PHP unit assertion functions. Yeah, it's it's simple. For BIAT, it's as simple as any step which throws any exception will be marked as uh, as failed. So anything that throws exception is failed in terms of BIAT. And PHP unit assertions, when you use them like that, they will throw exception if it's not true. Right, so you will get, you will know that this step doesn't work, that uh, your application doesn't really work. Yeah. And you see that we are storing, we are storing the token into a class property of our context. It's because the state, the state of the context is uh, is here for persisted per for is persisted for entire per scenario. Yes, and for so every scenario, Biat will create a new instance of, so you can uh, use it to to keep track of this kind of data. Yeah, so each step inside one single scenario will, will have the same uh, instance. It will work inside the same instance of, the, of this feature context class. But each scenario will have his own instance. So your scenario will be independent enough and will not cause any side effects. So after that, after this simple class, mm. you're doing the code. Yeah, you this have is to the part that we're, we're not showing. Uh, usually you're doing Silex application. Uh, with endpoints. That's, That's how we we did it. Yeah, I it's it's <laughs> most useful way to 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 build an application and and fastest. And at some point later, you will get this, and this is your green specification, which means that Biat actually done everything that we described in the feature context class, every mapped method. And every ma mapped method didn't throw an exception, and we knew that we know that there is assertion there, and those assertion didn't throw exception, which means that our application works. We're sure that our endpoints that we described work as we described, which means that, al which also means that if user will follow those steps, it will work. This scenario will work. So later you will add. Of course, we are s saving pools. But uh, to to use it for stats purposes, we need also to be able to to get data back from the API. Yeah. So, so we're describing the situation where we have a snowball cat and it already has two pores in the database. And when we get when we send the get request to some specific URL with token, then we get 200 response with some specific JSON array. Right? That's simple. Again, we're maybe we're adding a couple of steps to make this pass. We're implementing the code, and then we see this picture, right? Now we have two scenarios. Now we know that we can add ports to the system and get list of ports, so we can analyze it, right? So that's it, like, this is the process with which you're developing your application. So in order to remove something, you know, remove some uh, endpoint, you're removing the scenario, and you're basically you done, right? And you, you, you can add scenario for checking that it doesn't work anymore, but you're starting your work from scenarios and you don't really care about, uh, about updating the tests because your spec for the API is your test at the same time. And uh, your code is checked and it works against this spec every single time that you h have this green picture. And also, you have artifacts, right, of this process. So test were the first artifact, because as we are using assertion during the process of the steps, we can ensure that what we are saying here is true. Is also, this test is a spec, 
for your API, which means that if new guy comes to your company, comes to your project, you can show him this uh, particular feature, and 90% that he will understand how your application works, right? He will understand what exactly it does, how it should behave, and for internal talks, this is enough information to understand what we are providing through this application, what business values we're providing. And also, if you take a closer look, there is like pattern here. We're talking about the same things over and over again. And so it could be like external documentation. There is a lot of noise here. Like yeah, too keywords, many. Keywords, Gherkin keywords and all this stuff. And what you can do and what we did before is you can use the same parser that Gherkin, Ber Beat uses to parse this Gherkin file, parse it your, on your own, extract useful information and generate docs out of your features, right? And the way you're doing this, you're creating the parser. Uh, you're parsing the feature files yep. we, we created before. And, and this parser parse returns you a new feature node. It's a, yes, it's a OOP representation of your, of feature. your features. So you can iterate in this feature over your scenarios. In each scenario, you can iterate over the steps. And you can do two simple regular expression assertions. You can even copy them from your Z feature context. The goal is to extract the only the data we want to, we need for the document. So we need to extract the HTTP method, pass, which is URL. And uh, here we're just printing them as the text, right? So we don't care. And then we're getting the arguments, which is a string, and showing it too. And at the end, you will have something like that. Right? OK, it's not so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's just <laughs> for explanation sake. But come on, we, we've spent only 15 lines of code for that, right? So that's simple. But if you will put Bootstrap into equation or some other stuff, and you will like spend a couple, couple of, of time. Oh, of, it's of, a of hours. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to say minutes, but it's not it's not that simple. Front end development. Uh, no. and uh, you can get something like that. Right? This is a real life project. Gir giraffe application that we worked uh, on I don't know how a year ago. Yeah. Uh, and this application has really heavy Web API. It's actually the marketing, not marketing, it's uh, uh, analytics, e commerce, e -commerce analytics uh, application, which is really important to have good API with that, right? So we knew about the problems at the beginning that we will have documentation, we, will, we need to have testing, uh, and uh, we need to somehow synchronize this all. And we choose the approach of defining the specs, API specs, through the feature files. And uh, Later on, we needed to show external documentation for the developers out of the, out, uh, outside the company. We just wrote 50 lines of controller code to generate this documentation. And this entire documentation is automatically generated from the feature files, which are the specs for your API, which are the tests for your API. And you have them synchronized automatically every time you make any update to your test, ACA spec, uh, ACA code of application. And yeah, we, we, we get some useful information, like we put effort into showing useful information, like HTTP methods, what parameters you have, what you're sending, what response code you're, you're ex expecting to get. And yeah, it's, it's enough for a, a external developer to understand this information. And so what we have at the end, at the end, we have a process, which which is changed a little bit, because uh, the entry point of our process is now the specification, not the code. Not we're starting from the spec. That that's why it's called BDD, by the way, behavior driven development, because we're starting from description of behavior, and then we're going into implementation details. So we have after specifying some endpoints, we have still to implement it. Yeah. Sorry. And we have automatic tests. Yeah, it comes. It comes with it. And so let's let's take an, a, a, a same example. We are removing feature from endpoint. We're starting from the spec. Of course, we still need to remove the code from the from the code. But we get endpoints docs and endpoints tests for free. So we keep everything in sync. 
Yeah, and but our outside developers are happy with updated documentation, and our internal developers are happy with uh, green tests for everything. Yeah. Uh. So, questions? Anyone? Uh, hello. Um, I wonder how you integrate the BDD in the process of the development. Um, I mean, um, when you do TDD, you code before you no, you test before you code. Then in the BDD, is it the same way you do? Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, 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 the process uh, it's li it's a little bit stranger because you're actually. It's it's not like you're testing something because you don't have anything to test. That's what we've showed. So you're actually describing something that you have at this point no idea how you will implement, right? You're describing in plain text file with some specific format. You're describing how your application will work, and you have no idea, you know, like what controllers you will have, what code you will have. Usually, w when we're developing applications, we're describing features and. Even before we start to develop the project, we already have like five, seven features done. That's it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe we can show the, the first slide for it. Oh, yeah. This one? Yeah, this one. So we spoke about this part that yeah. is really easy to, to write in advance because you are describing what you will do and you are no you will never put uh, any technical details into this part after you will loop uh, into small cycle when where you will start uh developing uh using spec bdd so it will be uh more tied to the implementation but still you will um you will describe behaviors and not um states of your objects Here, here is usual unit tests, right? The, here you're doing TDD, and TDD, like unit TDD in BDD is called spec BDD because you're specifying the implementation details. So we didn't show you like the the process of doing implementation details. That's why we didn't because we we didn't have enough time. Yeah, but the main you get. You still, you are still driven. Your development is still driven by the stories, and when you are uh, trying to implement a scenario, you will go into this loop, and here you will go step by step. You will see the next required step by uh, maybe the zero message you get by executing your your scenarios, and you will implement the next one loop. Will be implementing the the small part that makes the first. Uh, parts that will make the, the system fail. And so you, you make the loop, and after you run again your stories, you see that there is something else that's missing to make your scenario work. So you start again a new loop, and, uh, and so on. So you, you don't have to, to write a lot of, uh, of tests bec before starting to implement something. And as as with any TDD process, you're writing eno just enough code to make your your test pass, which means like you're writing more tests, but you're writing m less application code. Usually, that's it. More questions? Um, at the oh end, geez. you say that removing a feature means only removing the code endpoint. And, uh, and well, and updating the sp updating the spec first. first step is the spec. Yeah, it's so you update the spec, and then you only need to remove the code, and everything else is handled for the documentation and the testing process. Yeah, but the testing process generation is not entirely automatic. We still uh, need you to tune. And that's why I told you, like this this process when you're writing the code inside your feature context class, right? Yeah. Uh, 
you will write it only once. Like you have this step which says like I send any like post, get, put, delete request to some URL with some data. And it's generic enough so next time you will need to send any type of request to any pass with any data, you will use the same test, the same description. So which means that when you do remove some scenario from your spec, you don't need to update it. Automatically. What? No, 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 no. Yeah, not not have to be removed. Actually, like they could leave if there is if if there is no step which calls some specific definition method, it will just not be called. That that's basically it. So your your specs will be green. Maybe you will have like couple of. Uh, not used any more definitions, but it's not a big deal. Usually, you you can you can you can fix it by cleaning up.